Well, thanks for coming to Queen City Merge. This is our first year, and uh, especially thanks for coming down here to hopefully learn about some responsive design and starting to do it in a different way. It's a big change for the way we operate on the web, and hopefully Bobby and I can walk you through how, us at, how we at Ample have started to tackle the problem. So, as I said, Bobby and I are from Ample. We are a uh, small batch digital agency in Cincinnati, just right down on the corner of Fourth and Elm. I'm a designer turned developer there, and Bobby, I think, is likewise former designer, now a developer. And Taylor McDonald, who's in the back somewhere, he's an, also a developer, I think designer turned developer as well. So three former designers and three developers now um, working as the three developers at Ample. So let's get started. So the general question, how many people do not have smartphones? There's one, I think one person, <laughs> two, <laughs> two person, two people out of the whole place. So obviously that shows that the smartphone market is growing exponentially year over year. And I wouldn't be surprised if after a few years it overtakes the PC sales, especially around the world. So I think AT&T has experienced about 5,000% growth over the past three years of smartphone usage. Um, there's about 4.5 billion smartphones in use today, and I don't really see this slowing down anytime soon either. So where does that leave us? It means that as web designers and developers, we are constantly having to adjust how we are displaying our information with new devices coming out on a weekly basis. Um, on each device, there's a number of different web browsers, Android and the iPhone, just to name a few. And then you have Opera Mini and all the other variants uh, across the world. Of course, no device is the same in the screen size. Uh, that would be too easy for us. So we're left to either design different sizes for each device or find another solution. And this brings us back to a new set of browser wars, something we thought we conquered in 1999. But with all these new mobile devices, it feels like we're fighting the same battles again. So what's a designer to do? When we first started doing this, we were a bit confused. I mean, we've been developing and designing websites for the same way for a number of years now. We start mocking things up in Photoshop, we pass it off to the, to the developer, and they cut it out and slice it up, and we're done. Right, and then so, usually sometime after the site launches, somebody comes back and says, hey, should we have a mobile site? Exactly. And, or the client... <laughs> Something keeps happening. So, sorry about that. So let's try to talk through some options. We can conquer the mobile site and the desktop site in the same stroke. So the classic way of doing it is to have a separate mobile site. I mean, it's probably pretty easy. It's what we're all familiar with. It's worked in the past. It caters to the device at hand. Um, and it really works for sites that are truly catered to a mobile, to a mobile experience, such as an airline site, um, a number of other sites. So for some sites, it is a good idea. But there are a lot of problems with that. I personally think that we can do a lot better in our projects without sacrificing content that's served up to our desktop users and leaving the mobile users left wanting more. I can't tell you the number of times I've been on a website trying to find the full site link, especially a new site um, or a blog site or what have you. I know there's something on there that when I find, I've seen it on my desktop before, but I just can't find where it is, and I'm off at 10 times looking for that full site link. It's usually a limited experience, and oftentimes when I try to share something on my phone, I end up sending out the mobile link, which looks like total crap in a normal size web browser. Plus, not to mention, us as developers are left to maintain separate sites, separate HTML, separate code, and all that stuff. Um, and honestly, I don't know how often we do maintain it. Usually the mobile site falls by the wayside while the desktop site keeps uh, progressing and the mobile site turns out to be crap in the end. So there's also mobile templates. A lot of these are offered by Tumblr, WordPress, you name it. You can usually apply these over your existing markup or 
ex into your existing theme on WordPress, and they're fairly easy, they're efficient, they're familiar to users, and it doesn't take much time to implement them. But again, I think we can do better than that. These are a bit boring, um, they always show the same thing, and in the end of the day, clients are paying to, for us to do this, so I think we're a little bit above just trying to pawn off a template onto our clients for their mobile experience. But the good news is we have been doing the HTML and CSS for years now. So what we are proposing and what a number of other people are doing is using the same HTML markup and structure and content that we've always been and we've been in this place before. So as I alluded to before, back in the web standards wars of 1999 through 2002 or even today for that matter, the man in the blue beanie, Jeffrey Zeldman, popularized the idea of separating structure from presentation. And it led to a whole range of things such as CSS Zen Garden, where basically they use the same content, same HTML, same markup, but just present it in different ways. So this is pretty much the epitome of the web, web standards movement, using CSS to adapt the layout and look and feel to flow differently, but keeping the structure and content intact. So, if we can use CSS to change the style of the device, why couldn't we use CSS to change how we're presenting it to different screen sizes? And the good news is that we can. And a number of people have been doing this for the last couple of years. Responsive design was popularized by Ethan Marcotte a few years ago in a List of Part article. And it means that we no longer have to write another copy of HTML. All, this, all the HTML stays the same. All the content stays the same. And we don't need to publish two separate sites. The URLs are the same, and it, it, in the end, I think everybody wins. Here's an example of work we did at Ample where the desktop site's on the left and the mobile's on the right, and the markup and everything else stays the same, all managed by the same CMS, all the same HTML. So, as I was saying before, responsive design was coined by Ethan in 2010 or so, and I've been messing around with it for a couple years. Um, and what it is, is a system of fluid grids, flexible images, and media queries. So, let's start with fluid grids. Fluid grids have been around for a number of years now, and they allow the browser to resize columns and reflow text and some content around the site. So that means all your content is laid out in percentages versus absolute pixel values or M values, and truly presenting a liquid layout. So as you resize the browser window, the content columns grow, shrink, and what have you. Plus, as developers, you could use a little bit of math, which is always a good thing, I think, but that's just me. Um, there are some problems with just straight up doing fluid grids, though. Um, it has been challenging to design a fluid grid to look right across a range of devices, I think. As content grows, as your text sizes, text cells grow, it becomes unreadable, and you're left with a huge paragraph, 120 characters long, that honestly looks really bad. So, an example of fluid grid is this formula here. Target divided by context equals result. Again, I don't want to get into too much detail here. A lot of good articles are online about how to actually apply this stuff. We just kind of wanted to give you a brief overview of how we're incorporating this into our process and moving forward and some of the challenges and solutions we came up with. So, 100 divided by 25 is 25%. That would be your H1 size and basically get the gist of it. So flexible images. Just like the fluid grids, these are images that grow and shrink within the container itself. So we'll have an image that's a column that's 25 pixels large, and we'll have an image to set the max width 100% and the width and height corresponds accordingly. Of course, this isn't supported in all older browsers, but newer browsers um, handle this quite well. And there's a bunch of JavaScript shims out there for the older browsers that don't really handle it. And media queries. Media queries are part of CSS3, and they are the heart of responsive design, I would say. Media fill queries may look a bit familiar because we've been using media types for a number of years, such as print style sheets, where we serve the subcontent to stuff you were printing off before on your websites. But they also come in a ton more flavors. You can do min width, max width, you can even target 
the orientation of the device, you can target the device itself. So the user agent string on the browser will tell the, tell the CSS which type of device it is if it's a newer browser. Um, there's a whole ton of them out there. You know, these are just a few variations and that could go on and on and on. But how are we supposed to learn all this? Seems like a lot to learn, especially since we've been doing this stuff for years now and we're pretty ingrained in our process. But thankfully, as I mentioned, this stuff came out a year ago or so. So there's, there's been a lot of people who've done some pretty awesome stuff with it already. So there's a whole bunch of frameworks out there to help you get started. Um, the two up the top, Twitter Bootstrap and Zurb Foundation, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, are just two basic HTML and CSS frameworks that help getting your content off the ground quick. Compass is a uh, SAS, uh, which is a form of a CSS preprocessor library. And the rest below are various JavaScript shims and others that help along the responsiveness. So onto these frameworks, here's an example of Zurb Foundation, which is really basic. It doesn't provide any styling at all, but just kind of sets the uh, look and feel of the content of the site. So you're left to put your designs on top of it. Another one that we at Ample especially like and have been doing a lot of work in is Twitter Bootstrap. Uh, this has really taken off lately and we've been using it a ton. I really can't praise this enough. Um, sometimes Bobby and I get in arguments about how semantic it is, but that's okay. I, he won eventually, but just because it saved me so much time in the long run. So, but this is awesome. I highly recommend checking either of these out just as a st starting point in your designs and development. So, as you saw how naked those looked, how do you design something on top of that? Do you still make Photoshop mockups? What do you do? So, now, with this new responsive design approach, as it's reflowing the content, has this totally screwed up our whole process? And I think, from what I've experienced in the past, it totally has. Yeah, I think that's actually what we want to focus most of the talk on today, is that I think you guys can all look up some examples online or copy and paste some code and start doing some responsive work. But what we found is that actually isn't the challenge. That, that's the easy part. The hard part is now, how do you design websites and get them approved by your clients and uh, design and iterate and interact with your developers to make these sites? It's, it's like three or four sites. It's not just one. And so how do you prepare for that upfront to make sure that you have a successful product at the end? Exactly. So we don't think this works anymore. Usually when you design, you're designing in Photoshop and you're designing in a vacuum. You're not actually getting in the browser, you're painting pr pretty pictures of websites, but you're not actually designing websites, you're, de you're designing pictures, which in the end turn out to be websites, but through that whole process, you lose a lot, there's a lot change, there's a lot compromised, and I personally think it's too, re too resource intensive to do that. We're designing all these Photoshop files, we're making all these PDFs, and at the end of the day, once everything's in the browser, and in CSS and in HTML, what do you do with the PSDs? You probably throw them out or throw them away, throw them in the trash, put them on Dropbox. There's some taking up space somewhere that you're not actually using them. And another problem here is there's a miscommunication. You're sending false hopes through these PSDs but for the client, I think. They're seeing these beautifully rendered pictures of websites, but when they see them in IE8, IE7, IE9, whatever, Chrome, they don't look the same and you're left spending hours upon hours trying to get these things to look the same in all browsers and in the end, it's never going to, or if it does, you're kind of compromising your design. So, I think that we need to think about, think about this in a new way. More of, ideally, the designer being the developer or the developer being the designer. Kind of like a hybrid between the two. Or, if that's not the case, at least have an open really open form of communication between your front-end developers and your designers. Meaning they work together, sit together, they both understand each other's roles, they both respect each other, and they both can jump in and the developer can de design a little bit and the designer can develop a little bit. Basic design skills, basic design skills such as layout, typography, color theory, wouldn't be that hard to learn for a developer and basic HTML and CSS shouldn't be that hard to learn for a designer and they both complement each other, plus you gain a large understanding and respect for the other's work. So, 
One of the ways this has been popularized, and if we're going to ditch Photoshop, is to start thinking in a mobile-first mindset. This lets the designer focus on the most important areas of the site. So it removes a lot of superfluous content from the site. It gets ingrained a mobile-first mindset from the beginning. It lets everybody trim out everything that's not important to the site and really focus on what matters. I'm going to a new site. I want to read the content. I don't want to see a bunch of ads. I don't want to see a weather ad. I don't want to see a deal chicken ad. I just want to see the news. So a good example that I saw at a talk a few years ago was somebody taking the Southwest site and redesigning that from a, mo from a mobile first mindset. So up top you have the, in the top right, you have the initial Southwest site and you have the right. So what this guy did, he's, he basically took it and said, look, we don't need this, we don't need this. Why don't we just focus on what's making the mobile site so effective and so simple and so awesome and put them on the desktop site with maybe some prettier pictures. Of course, let's take advantage of the desktop site with bigger pictures, with better, with better typography, but keep it as simple as possible. And I think this definitely improves the overall user experience. So enough for these examples. Let's try to make something briefly together here, and we can walk you through the entire process from start to finish. So what Bobby and I talked about and the rest of the people at Ample was starting a refresh Cincy group, kind of that we're introducing here at Queen City Merge. Um, refresh Cincy is a part of other ref refresh groups around the country interested in bringing developers, designers, and anyone else interested in technology together on a monthly or bi-monthly basis to basically talk all things design, development, copywriting, content strategy, and all that stuff on the internet. It's kind of like a mini Queen City merge happening each month. We hope to have the first one up and going by June or July based on how busy we get. So let's walk through that. So phase one. Phase one is usually the same as it always been. We're not changing a lot of stuff here. Um, usually set the milestone, scope, budget, timing, doing a bit of interviews, doing the IA work and content strategy. Um, figuring out how we should communicate the client's needs and ideals, setting a direction, and doing competitor research before we move forward. So theoretically, we've done this on Queen City Merge already. So Refresh Cincy, our client, wants a clean site, relevant information on the site, and they want to track local technologists, writers, hackers, designers, etc. They want it to be easily accessible on any device, but they don't know exactly how they want to do that. So phase two is also the same. And I thought you said, Ryan, that a lot of these things were new, but we're going to get to that. So phase two, usually you start by sketching out the home page and, and UX and more often, and you know, just your basic wireframe stuff. But during the wireframe phase, you can really set the layout of the site and explain this to the client that this is how the layout should be. So after agreeing on the content and where other important areas of the site go, we can really start to refine this process or to show how we start wireframing this. And a few of the wireframing tools that we use is something that I showed earlier is Twitter Bootstrap. So we're actually wireframing in the browser. And Twitter Bootstrap, I think, works great for this. It's really easy to start and get up and running, number one. And number two, you're actually producing HTML and content that you can use at a later date which is awesome because you're not throwing away wireframes like I mentioned before how you're throwing away Photoshop files. So we have a base HTML structure that's already in place that we can build upon later and it gives the client an opportunity to, to actually click through the site and see what, how their data actually looks in a very rough stage. They're not just handed a bunch of, you have a question? Yeah, no, 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 go ahead. Um, no, go ahead. So Um, more often than not, we actually keep the bootstrap markup because I don't, I personally don't think, I was under the impression, I was a very big idealist in semantic web design uh, for a number of years, of having everything named, the class names be perfect, no span, 12 grid names in my CSS, in my markup, and 
as I develop more and more of these sites, I've come to folk realize that that stuff really doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> I mean, it matters to a certain degree, but the semantic web is great in theory, but in practice, how many of us are actually keeping the same HTML and CSS when we design a new site? Right. Right. It depends on a case by case basis. I mean, when I've been doing a lot of the bootstrap stuff lately, if there's a lot of overrides that I don't agree with or I think I want to override, then it's fairly easy to override. But just for the layout structure itself, it's great. And it provides a great baseline to start building upon. And it's awesome in that regard. Um, but yeah, if anybody else has any questions, Taylor? So yeah, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to speak up. I'm trying to keep this as informal as possible. So honestly, just speak up whenever you have a chance. So um, plus it allows the content to reflow in the browser if you're using the Bootstrap Fluid CSS. I'll light over there. So um, now that we have a base set of HTML and CSS that we can build upon, let's start with the design. But how do we design, this is something I touched upon earlier, how do we design for a fluid grid and layout capabilities if we're designing Photoshop? Do we design multiple PSDs, one at 320 pixels, one at 540, one at 940? And if we do, what do we do with all those? So I don't think we do that. I was never a big fan of this to begin with, and I'm definitely not a huge fan of it now. I think it works better to forget your old way of working and it's because it's practically impossible for the designer to do. We need the ability to present multiple comps to the client, we need the look, but we need to set the look and feel of the site. So how do we set the look and the feel of the site without designing fully in the browser and show something to the client? An idea popularized beginning of last year by Samantha Warren is the idea of style tiles. And style tiles allow the client to focus on the look and the feel of the site without being hung up on the layout. They're more detailed than mood boards, and they reinforce an identity without actually focusing on the layout, like I said. So you can see on the two, uh, two images on the right, they're two kind of similar looks and feels, but you can see they're different enough by presenting different backgrounds, different type, different button forms, and different images. So let's take these idea of style tiles and apply them to the refresh Cincy site. This is example number one, which is huge. But um, you can see on the top we have our logo. On the right we have our main headline set in FF Meta. We have our subhead and we have our body copy set in Meta Serif. And the text link is red. There's colors on the left, the primary colors we're going to use, black, white, blue, and red. And there's two textures blocks, but you can't really see them from the projector, but it's two textures things. Plus we, plus we have an image in the background, and what this basically does is sets the look and feel of an example of how the site might look on the beginning when it's applied to the wireframes and HTML. Here's another example here, which looks similar, but different enough to give the client a different look and feel. And we feel this way, the, like I was alluding to earlier, the client isn't hung up on having to change things just to say they change things. So they can really whittle it down the feel of their site as opposed, to struck, as opposed to focusing on where the search bar goes or where the navigation goes. But I understand that this isn't for everybody and it's not even for all our clients because it's very hard to convince them to do. It really takes an extremely forward thinking client to accept this because they're so used to being presented with full page mockups in Photoshop. And that's okay. I definitely think that's okay to stick with and I guarantee we're still going to do that too. But 
it's also important to emphasize how much things are going to change from that full page mock-up in Photoshop along the course of your development. So just for fun, I mocked up the whole site in Photoshop to see how this might look for a client. So I did this fairly quickly. I didn't focus on a lot on very much detail, but it kind of does set the overall mood, look and feel of the site once we're going to be done. As you'll see along the way, things will change and things will adapt, but this kind of does set the mood for a client. The most important thing that if you do go down this road, who do go down this road is not to overdo it. Don't start creating pages upon pages upon pages of site maps, site templates, because you're just going to hurt yourself in the end if you're approaching this from a responsive point of view. Yeah, so in, in imagine that if you took this style, this, this, this one page got approved by the client, and you took that in, applied that to those HTML and CSS wireframes that you had in Twitter, Twitter Bootstrap, you can imagine that, that that site has already come to life, and you've, you've really laid out the header and footer for all the pages it's, it's now just individual elements that might need to get styled that weren't represented in this original mock-up. So you've just done 80% of the work for a lot of it without having to uh, mock up additional pages in Photoshop and get them approved individually. Exactly. And it's important to stick to your guns and remind the client that the web is a fluid medium. It's not print and things are going to change. So, as we were saying before, this design development phase is really are the most radical change in the process. You could either need a designer who can develop or a developer who can design or two people working extremely close together who completely trust one another and respect one another. So once you get one of these people or two of these people, as Bobby was alluding to before, you take the wireframes that you already created in Twitter Bootstrap and you apply the styles that were approved by the client. Which is great because you save a whole lot of work. You already have stuff you already made, you already have stuff you have gained approval upon, and you're not throwing anything away, a little away. Um, designing in the browser, I also think, speeds up development time significantly. Um, for one, you're not wasting two separate resources trying to, sorry, you're not wasting two resources, hold on, you can take over if you want. Okay, better? So you're not wasting two separate resources, one person designing a bunch of PSDs while the other just sits around and then throws them away after they're done with them. Plus, if you're working that close together, you can really communicate and work through ideas in the process. You're not just one mind here, one mind there, and then you end up fighting between designers and developers, your topography is wrong, this is too hard to implement. You can really have a better discussion going forward behind all this stuff. But it's also important that knowing this, the designer is also able to quickly jump into Photoshop, take a screenshot of the website you're working on, and mock up something, such as a side navigation, if that really needs to be. Some people are better designing in CSS, some are better designing in Photoshop. It doesn't really matter, but the whole point is not to do the whole thing in a full page mock-up. If you want to mock up a pull quote in Photoshop because you know you can do it 10 times faster and do 10 times different styles, I mean, that's definitely the way to go. And it definitely limits the miscommunication between designers and developers. And I think the client loves this as well, because at the end of the day, they're presented with a fully designed site, partially designed site, for the most part, minus any changes, on top of Twitter Bootstrap, which they've already approved. And it's a lot more hands-on than a bunch, 30 pages of PDFs that they're gonna see. Yeah, a lot of the work we do is in abstract, and you only see pieces at a time. And I think the earlier that you can get a full picture, which I think these clickable prototypes do, the, it has been so much easier for us to uh, have our clients get their, their arms around the project and, and really see it come to life. It, it really makes it more real for them than these, these like 70 pages of these you know, black and white boxes. And to try to comprehend and understand what that's, that's doing is, is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Plus, it seems like we're moving a lot quicker in this whole process anyway. Usually when you hand something off to a client, such as 30 pages of PDFs, they have to take, with, take it with them, digest it for a bit, give you their changes, then you get your revisions, and then it eventually goes to the front-end designer, and then they give changes, and it seems like we're moving a lot quicker when we go this process. And honestly, I think it's a lot less stressful, believe it or not. So back to designing with mobile first. What we have found, and what a lot of people have found designing with responsive web design, is basically when you start, to start with the base styles first. 
So you start with a mobile first style sheet or a small screen style sheet first because this will help really set the mood and look at the feel of the site. So you're setting your topography, your background images, your textures, and doing this way will allow those browsers who don't support media queries to degrade gracefully to still show something that's presentable and readable. It's kind of like a uh, print style sheet for the older browsers who won't support them. All the content's still there, it's still readable, and it still looks nice, in my opinion. Um, you can use JavaScript shims to have older versions of IE support responsive web design, or you can stick with this. Um, it's really up to you. Also, starting with a mobile first style sheet prevents, larger, prevents smaller screens, such as mobile devices, from downloading large images, especially large, large background images. So, let's say you have a 940 pixel wide site, you have a beautiful large background image on the left, but you don't necessarily want to want to show that to a small screen and make them download that if they're on the go. Because they're not going to really appreciate it, it's not going to be in the correct design format for them, so this basically doesn't force them to load it because you're only going to start loading those as your screen size increases. So after we get the base styles done, we can really build up from there. And designing the browser and the base styles brings our refresh and site to look something similar to this on the phone. All these styles will be carried out throughout this site. Um, there's no superfluous images here. All the content's there and easily accessible because we've been designing from a mobile first standpoint the whole time. It's clean and simple and it's direct. If you want to register for the conference, you click there, you see where it's at, I see when it's at, and you scroll down and get more content. But basically because we started from a mobile first standpoint, it's really easy and really simple. So after this, where do we go next? And how do we know what device size to target? If you look on the right, if you look on the left, some of those phones on the left have web browsers. All those ones on the right definitely do, and almost all of those phones on the right are different screen sizes. So do we target 300, 320 pixels, 340, 350? Who knows? The device size is always gonna increase, shrink as we move forward. And we want our websites to last as long as possible, as long as the design is So it's important to think of responsive design not in terms of device size, but in terms of screen size, whether that be small screens, large screens, medium screens, what have you. So you want to set your media queries to focus on the, on the design of the site, not the device. You might have an iPhone today, you might have a Zyboard tomorrow, whatever you want to have, make sure your website fits on it. So if we have the base styles done, and those all look good in smaller screen devices, why not move up a little bit to middle of the road devices such as iPads and larger tablets that are a bit larger than just a mobile device and see how our, our design is going to flow then. By doing so, we're allowed to add a little bit more design elements into it such as floating things left and right, larger images, more background images, and a bunch of other design niceties. <coughs> Excuse me. So after looking in Photoshop and our device for a little bit, we decided about 560 pixels is a good width for design and it really makes it look pretty nice. So enter our media query. What we're basically saying here is target the screen and a minimum width of 560 pixels. So anything larger than this will be served, font size 1.5 EM, the event description will be floated left, and the width will increase to 33%. That was 100% before, it had no float, the font size was something different. So after doing all that, we added a background image, well doing all that and a lot more, we added a background image to the below on the refresh Cincy description. We floated the description to the left up top. We floated the date and time to the right. And we're able to better target larger screens based on their size and make it really shine. So after that, let's go a little bit bigger to the desktop site and use another media query which sets the screen at 940 pixel minimum width and again, we're increasing the font size, maybe a, 
increasing the event description a little bit, and using our handy formula of target divided by context equals result, which is the basis of fluid grids, which we talked about earlier. So after we do all that, it reflows to something like this. So obviously this is similar to what we mocked up in Photoshop before, but definitely a lot different in the end. And the reason I think it's a lot different is because we were able to get into the browser, really start testing some stuff and digging in and adjusting stuff as it reflows, as it moves around the page, as the content grows in length. And it's very similar to what we had, but in the end, it's different. So this hopefully showed why it's important to focus, why the content is not going to be a per picture perfect painting of the Photoshop file. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like I was saying before, like the fluid grid thing is a problem because you have those huge rows of text, which is like 120 characters. I think the optimal reading width is 60 or so characters for a certain line length. So there's a few things we can do. I showed a few links before. Um, I think it was jQuery Fit Text, which is done by the guys at Paravel. It's uh, based on the size of the containing element. It'll resize the text to a max and a min. So you set a range in there, how big you want it to get. You can always set a max width on your device too, but then you have those white columns. But a lot of those big screen TVs and, and things like that, also they, the resolution isn't that much more than that, like the MacBook Pro right there. It's just that they seem a lot shorter too. So the amount of vertical space is almost the, uh, sure. the largest constraint there. Right. Yeah. Plus you can increase text size in your media queries too. So maybe our next one is at 1020, your next one's at 1240 or whatever, and just kind of reflow from there. Obviously, you can keep going on till infinity, but using different shims like the jQuery fit text as the text size gets bigger and bigger is what I found to be an acceptable solution so far. Right. You're a lot closer. Exactly. There's projection, I know that. I don't know if there's TV, but I don't know. It's a good question. It's something you can definitely dive into later. Um, I don't know if projection does pick up TV or if it's just projectors or. That'd be tough oh. too because it would all depend on your configuration. A lot of people just have the HDMI cable. I, I, I doubt that that would right. pick that up. Yeah. Plus, you know, oh, go ahead. Right. No, yeah, it's a good question. Um, a lot of the base styles, like I said, stay the same. But it's really getting in the browser and really finding out how it looks and how it feels. You know, if text is too small, you obviously want to resize that. If text is too big, you want to resize that. Uh, basic percentage, because we're designing from a mobile first standpoint that we want everything to be clean and simple, I don't necessarily change a whole lot. 25% maybe, if that. Not a whole ton, but I mean, around then, around there. So it's better than designing a whole separate mobile site. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Working in this type of mindset, um, you can compare it to your work before doing this and doing it for a while though, but do you find it to take a longer period of time from beginning to the breakpoint to end when working with a client? Is it going with this approach or is it less time? Like to me, it's just, just by looking at it, I would think it would, it would increase the time. I mean, it's like going to take months. Right. I actually think. Because we're cutting out all the design in Photoshop and we're not sending PDFs over to the client anymore, I think it almost balances out or is even shorter. Yeah, I would think it's, for us it's been shorter in that the, the elapsed time, um, 
before was, was about 70% of the work was <coughs> completed by designers. So if you imagine a designer in, in design making wireframes for a few weeks, getting those approved, then a designer working in Photoshop for a few weeks and getting those approved, and then all of that data dumped on, on a developer, and then he would work for those, that number of weeks to build that. Versus now we're talking about those wireframes are in HTML with the developer. A lot of that design after the initial comps are with the developer, so it's like two people working at the same time. Maybe it's the same amount of work, but at least now it's completely overlapped, and so you can say that's like a 50%. Right. It's like the designer's t time is almost increasing, so it takes longer for the client to see the final designs, but it takes shorter time for the developer to give them the full site. So you're kind of smushing the two, and in the end, probably ending up a shorter time. So. So after everything has been bought in by the client, there shouldn't be a whole ton of changes from the client because we've been presenting this the whole time to the client, back and forth. It's just not something we're holding away on for two or three weeks and then showing the client where they feel obliged to change something or feel obligated to change something because they are paying for us, but they're actually working with us the whole time. And they can make changes along the way incrementally, which honestly can sometimes be frustrating, but I think it results in a better product in the end. Um, Browser testing should probably be pretty minimal if a mobile-first mindset has been applied from the beginning. Um, everything's pretty simple on the page. We're probably using a bootstrap, Twitter bootstrap observe foundation, which layout and base styles have been browser tested by a huge number of developers on GitHub and everywhere else. Uh, there's minimal garbage at the end. There's no more PSDs to get rid of. There's no more PDF to throw away. There's all that stuff on your Dropbox is not even there. Better communication with the client usually means a better product in the end. Uh, the line of communication is always open. We better respect the client for what their problems are. And in the end, I think the client better respects us for knowing what we're actually dealing with and how much we respect them. And the best part about this, I think, is there's no huge surprise to the client at the end. Usually when we go into a pitch meeting or a presentation meeting, we're sitting behind this cloak and we pull something down and it's this thing they haven't seen before so they feel obligated they have to change something or they have to say something even if it's perfect even if the design is perfect everything they asked for they feel like they have to say something or they're not getting their money's worth so this way if you're working this closely with the client throughout this whole process they're more obligated to get buy-in through this so after that we launch and then we usually drink uh, a few caveats with responsive design though there's definitely problems nothing is perfect especially not responsive design. Um, number one problem that I've come across is there's no solution for loading different sized images or not an easy solution for loading different sized images to different sized devices. So something I touched upon earlier was what if you don't want to load a large background image to a small site? You can accomplish that through CSS, but what if it's just an image tag? How is the browser going to know not to load that image tag on a mobile device but load the big image on a desktop device? Or if you do want to load the images in both places, but one is 50% of the size of the other, that's a huge right. uh, file size different, difference. And obviously on the mobile, that you know every kilobyte matters. Mm -hmm. There's a number of server-side solutions out there. Uh, we at Ample have been using uh, Dragonfly uh, through Rails to serve up different size images based on the type of device you have. But you might not necessarily have that solution at your disposal. There's a number of JavaScript shims out there which are really increasing um, day by day. I think there's a huge debate every time you look online about what solution is the best, how we target this, and how do we do this. The biggest problem that I've encountered with this, or I've read about with this, is the recent design of the Boston Globe site, because that's being served up to millions of people on a week, and they're serving up millions and millions of bandwidth images. and. If you read or search for responsive design Boston Globe, you'll find a whole wealth of information out there that's tackling this exactly the same, exact same subject. So another caveat is there is no support on older browsers such as IE7 or 8, which, as I mentioned before, is OK if you're OK serving them a very basic print style sheet or if you're OK using a JavaScript shim. Once you start putting all these shims in your project, though, you do risk slowing down your site in terms of load, in terms of maintainability, and all that stuff. You also need to educate the client in this, in this change of process, which, is, which can be hard. Um, they're used to doing things a certain way for the past 15, 20 years. 
and then a new agency comes in and says we're going to shake things up, it could be a tough pill to swallow at times. You know, they might be surprised you're not going to show them their full site design in Photoshop and three different comps and all this stuff they like, that they think they're paying for. But sometimes a better education is worth it. And as I hopefully touched on before, this is pretty hard to incorporate into your current workflow. I'm guessing a lot of people work in established design agencies that have been around for 15, 20 years already and have a pretty set process to get in there. Everybody's set in their ways and they're resistant to change. But one of the first projects we did at Ample about this was a smaller project. So it really allowed us to get our hands dirty and to take a little bit more time and to play around with it. So maybe if your agency is struggling to adapt this process, maybe take it on your own to do a side project for your agency, maybe an open, an open source project you guys have released or something like that where you can really start to experiment and show this to your um, owners, bosses, whatever, that this might be a solution for you. And the last the very important caveat is that all sites should not be responsive. I wholly believe that. I wholly believe that se separate mobile sites, there should be separate mobile sites for, for different uses. I, that Southwest example was a great example before. Oftentimes when you're looking at the Southwest site, you're probably gonna be looking at it either to book a ticket, I mean to check when your plane's arriving or departing and that might just be a better case for a mobile site versus trying to buy a ticket, which is where you find the desktop. Right, and I think a great way to think about that is, is it not only that the size of the content needs to change, but does the workflow change? And I think in the, in the instance of a booking site, you would definitely change your workflow for the number of steps that it would take. You might not give them as much optionality in customizing their itinerary if they're on a mobile device, so you could speed up the process. So if you're changing the workflow, you probably don't want to go responsive. Right, and it really, it really depends on the project and the conversation you have with the client. You know, if they're totally against it, if they think their product ends up being better on a mobile site, and there's sometimes you just can't convince them, and then you just gotta go with it. So, let's move on to a little bit of bonus round, so we got time. So, some stuff about advanced response design with this awesome graphic. Um, this stuff, I think, is getting easier by the day as more and more of us get into it, experiment, play around, and try to do new things. The biggest boon, I think, is the advance of CSS preprocessors such as SAS and LESS. Uh, I felt that these have greatly improved the way we're doing things and have definitely sped up our development time a huge ton. I can't even, I tried to write CSS the other day, the old way before I did with SAS and LESS, and it was pretty painful. Yeah, how many people here have used any uh, CSS preprocessors? A good number. Yeah. So. If you have a time to check it out, less is a good one to start with because there's a lot of good Windows and um, Mac apps that are out available for that that don't require a lot of knowledge of the command line. If you're a little bit more command line oriented or know your way around a Rails or a Ruby app, then definitely check out SAS. They're both great. We use SAS at Ample because we use, do a lot of Rails development, um, but I've used both and they're very, very similar. Along with both libraries, SAS, and, I mean, along with both, there's a bunch of different libraries like Compass I mentioned before that include a lot of built-in mix-ins, which are basically functions for these things. So a good example would be a button function. So let's say I wanted to create a button in CSS, pure CSS. So I would create a mix-in that I plug in create button and I plug in a text size on my element. It would spit back all the process, all the styles that would need to create a button, such as the width, the height, the border, the font, everything else. Uh, there's great nestable declarations. Like I said, there's the ability to create functions to speed up development. And I found I've been slowly building a code library that I've been using on all my projects, sort of like a getting started guide that has all my mix-ins and everything in it, such as setting the type, making a button size, resetting stuff, clearing floats, all that stuff that you find yourself doing over and over again on yeah, each just project. Even setting variables for all your colors. So exactly, yes. How many times you've had to do a find and replace through right. 10 style sheets to yes. find the red. Exactly. I know variables are supposed to be coming in CSS4 or whatever it is, but they're already here now with SAS and LESS, and might as well start using them if they're out there. A few criticisms of SAS and LESS, it creates big style sheets, but in the end, 
I don't really think a few kilobytes is going to kill us on, uh, on the web. I think we're sweating too many things when we start worrying about that. So let's do a code example of some SAS stuff. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Um, one thing that I found very useful in SAS is to um, is to actually create like like uh, create a mix of I don't know if you find any just apologize. No worries. Um, but like to actually create my the has the formula for my grid in it. And right. Instead of having a bunch of classes called grid dash, you know, and I would have uh, I would have a regular class for that for a module and then that Right. Yeah. There's a I think I'm a yeah, no, no problem. There's a previous slide, I think. It was called Suzy Grid. Compass has a built-in grid system. I think it's based on Blueprint. I'm sure you've seen a bunch of others. You can write your own, um, which is able to keep the markup semantic, and it's able to keep your CSS fairly clean. Yeah, um, and Bootstrap has its own as well. Twitter Bootstrap has, it's all built into there. But Where you can customize your grid, number of columns, amount of space, and then it'll redefine all of that for you. Based on the variables, which is an example next. So as Bobby was saying before, we can set variables up top, such as break small, break medium, and break large. And as opposed to defining a grid here, I'm gonna define my media queries through SAS. Um, this mix-in type is in SAS 3.2, which I think still is in beta, which that content object there will be spit out based on the if statements. But basically what this means is you can start doing if statements in your CSS. So for example, we set up our mix-in here, which is a function that can you detect the tiny screen, small screen, medium screen, or wide screen, and based on that, apply the appropriate styles. So this allows us to write a media query next to our base styles, and I think maintains the overall readability. So up top, the event details, the width is 100%, the float is none. Below that, we include our SAS mix-in, which says include respond to medium screens, we float that left, we make that 63%. And below that, we respond to wide screens, increase a little bit, bet, a little bit more, and then we close out our SAS at the beginning, at the end here, which might look a little funny now to those um, who aren't used to less than SAS, but spend around a day or two, and it's pretty easy to pick up. Um, like this, unless, and like my non-semantic stuff, I was pretty resistant to change. Um, I was a pretty big stickler in clean CSS before, but after working this for a few weeks, I really uh, jumped up the bandwagon full steam. I also think doing it this way, um, even using SAS and less, helps developers make changes easier in the future. It keeps everything better organized, and it's better for working on a large team. Um, some of the things we've been trying to work through at Ample is a better way how to do object-oriented CSS, which basically is separating our CSS blocks into different objects. So multiple developers can work at a time and it's not all in one developer's head saying this is how I organized it, but kind of standardizing the process. So one more example of a SAS mix-in would be to target your iPhone. What this is saying is make sure the media is a screen so it's not print. Make sure it has a min device pixel ratio of two, i.e. retina display. And if it does, spit back out the content that we pass to it and give a WebKit background size, which is needed to target the only WebKit, to resize the background image we served up to WebKit. So in practice, oh, sorry. Um, no, because right here, we're not going to serve up the, I don't mouse there, we're not going to serve up the ICO dash time at 2x to anything other than is a retina image, that, it, that is a retina display. So we're going to serve up the regular size um, image to every other screen, every other, every other mobile device, but what our media query does here and our mix-in does is say, hey, if this is a retina display based on that WebKit, whatever the thing that means, device pixel ratio two, then we serve up the content block that was passed to it, and we include the, variable, the uh, function arguments in the top where it says 41 and 48 pixels. 
Yeah. I have a question. Just kind of a general, you know, from a, from a business, uh, you know, client standpoint, I mean, what kind of uh, things do you hear from the client that sort of make, you know, click in your head like, okay, we need to make this a responsive, you know, pattern, if you will. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, clearly if they say, all right, we want to support iPhone and right. desktop, and, you know, maybe yeah. not going to going to worry about it. Right. Or are they saying, look, we want anybody that ever hits our site on any smartphone to be okay? Um, as we develop for the web more, I think it's largely starting to be irresponsible for us as designers and developers not to serve content that's accessible and approachable to mobile devices from the get-go. Um, as I tried to show before, everybody's buying a new mobile device every day, and my mom doesn't use a computer anymore. My dad barely uses a computer anymore. These are, they're either looking at their iPhones or their iPads. They don't even use laptops anymore. So all the personal projects that I usually do are all responsive just because I'm a dork and I like to uh, challenge myself on that kind of thing. But uh, to your question, I think if it's almost any site should be responsive unless they want a separate mobile app and they have time for it. It's not a rush job of a site. If they need it done next month, then you're already familiar with your current process. Um, stick with that. I mean, but if you do have time, I think almost every other site should start to m move that way in the future. Just because mobile is continuing to grow, and I don't see it slowing down. Yeah, I think almost soon. everything that that we work on has like a mobile component. It's always something folks want to think about, especially for the the uh, clients that have those use cases where they know that business is transacted or, or they have clients using that, the mobile device. But I'll tell you, that the biggest thing that we hear from our clients right now is making sure that when we start a new site, it's like, I want it to look great on the iPad. And that has been one of the biggest uh, drivers for us in, in using technology like this. Is it's really helped us to give them uh, great experiences on that iPad because they've got their sales teams taking that out and doing demos. And they're like kind of dropping PowerPoint and using their website on an iPad to actually run their, run their new business pitches, which I think is really cool. And if you get good at this, I mean, if you get good, this is really familiar to you, and the client doesn't even ask for it, and you develop this way, and then one time they're checking on their fight, they're checking their site on their phone, and they see something that looks awesome on it, and they didn't even ask for it, like, whoa, how'd I get this for free? And you're like, well, you didn't. This is responsible development these days. This is how we do it. This is how we should be doing it if the site calls for it. So going forward, as I mentioned before, Refresh Cincy's first meetup will probably be announced for sometime in June or July. Um, RefreshCincy.com, the site isn't live yet, but the GitHub repos here, if you want to take that, clone it, mess around with it, as all the code that I, all the code examples I had be there before, just make sure you download it. I think it uh, requires a few things, but other than that, it's, uh, it's all up there and available for free. Let's see here. It requires a, let's see, I'll try to put up the static version on there. Right now it requires middleman, which is a Ruby, uh, that's too much detail, it's a Ruby server thing, which uh, you have to install, but uh, I'll put a simplified version up there after this talk, sometime after there. So, if there's any outstanding questions, which I definitely welcome, Mm -hmm. How do you guys handle that problem? That's a very good question. Um, there's a library called, I think it's tiny.js, tiny.js, something like that. But it basically takes your navigation, once it reaches a certain size, the JavaScript will detect that, puts it into a drop down. That would be good on a small screen device. Yeah. How do you guys handle like, um, accessibility? Like, so, so you talk a lot about good responding using JavaScript libraries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the clients we just uh, we're just working on now is basically a uh, reading for the visually impaired, and I think if you create good markup in the beginning, it's clean, semantic, and you're serving up a basically, like I said, a print style sheet to older browsers. If the markup's clean, good class names, good heading tags, it's going to be accessible. Um, 
Yeah, it's another, that's another benefit to go responsive versus a separate mobile site is using the best practices for accessibility on the desktop site. You've already got that baked into the, the mobile version, so you don't have to worry about checking that code twice. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can uh, put it on a, uh, what's that thing from order list? What's that called? Is that speaker deck? Yeah, speaker deck. I'll put it on speaker deck. Probably to put the links on Queen City Merge site once the whole conference is over too. I'm sure other people want to share their presentations and we can throw it up there. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely put it up. Um, yeah. Not really a whole lot, honestly. I mean, I think it's more of a me being a geek standpoint and me trying to optimize things as much as possible from, I mean, just trying to s serve up the best possible solution, I'm kind of a perfectionist at times. And if it's loading slow on my phone, I know other people are going to be annoyed too, so. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right, and especially, um, it's one of the big problems, like I said, with responsive design. There's no good solution to uh, those large images until we use a JavaScript shim or a server-side technology. Right, it's usually not on uh, our side either that we're, we're the ones trying to add more graphics. We're usually trying to <laughs> exactly, yes. A little bit less. We're trying to take this stuff away. <laughs> huh? All text.